Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's cousin Diana, and Joe told me we're going to have an impressive guest today, but apparently he's just been a marketer for Ben and Jerry's. I'm sorry, but getting people to eat Ben and Jerry's, not that hard. That We'll see what he would say anyway, as we welcome ice cream man and author of the soulful art of persuasion, Jason Harris. Plus, we have a woman nearly single-handedly making his job even easier, his best customer, Paulette Perkins. Hatch. Then we welcome the man whose ice cream gets more frozen the longer he holds it, OG. But that's not all. I'll freeze your brain with my trivia question later. And now a guy who puts the chunks of cash in the ice cream of your portfolio with a core of financial stability. It's Joe Salcihai. Hey there, stackers, and thank you, Diana, for the great introduction. I am Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. It is Friday, and we're super happy to talk about marketing yourself today. And we do have a very special guest, but first of all, let's talk to the gentleman across the card table from me, Mr. OG. How are you, brother? Cold and icy. It is. And for North Texas, what the hell's going on here? Particularly cold and icy. I have to wait all the way till next Wednesday to golf. You do. That is that ridiculous. Sucks. Have to wait four days. Winter and before sucks we, this week. <laughs> it does suck. And before we meet our guest of honor, let's say hello to Paulette Perhatch. Paulette, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Excited to talk about marketing where I feel like I have something to contribute. <laughs> well, you contribute. You bring it every week, sister. Come on. Tell us where have where have your pieces appeared lately? I have been having a really great run of pieces in the New York Times. I've been in the New York Times like 10 times since 2016, and I've gotten four assignments from them already this year, which is bananas. That's fabulous. So that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Do they pay well? Are, are they like 14 cents a word, 16 cents a word? It's a dollar a word at the New York Times. <laughs> and I had a story published that I worked on. It took me like a year and four other rejections to, oh uh, to get it done. So I'm really excited about it, about a bride with a prosthetic made by an artist that just who had a, an incredible story. So really just the, all the feels and... Um, and just a good good week to be a writer. But yeah, it turns out it's a lot of work to write for the New York Times too. You don't think about that, but you're like, you get the assignment and you're like, I oh, this is shock. really hard. It's very high standard. Absolute, <laughs> absolute shock to hear that. Let's say hello also to the hostess with the most. Diana Miriam joins us, as you guys heard earlier. How's the economy conference coming along? I heard we're going to have a packed house in Cincinnati. Oh, yeah, it's happening. It's happening. We've got it coming up here in a month and a half kind of freaking out <laughs> but it is all coming together and i know we're going to be partying together joe uh we've we'll got be. some fun stuff planned for the audience so yeah it's I gonna can't be great wait. are there tickets left yes there are a few tickets left so you can grab your ticket at economyconference.com and remember that economy is that m-e at the end rather than an m-y because i'm a huge fan of misspelled words you, you are well it is the economy of me yeah economy of me yes absolutely and a guy who runs a marketing agency that not only has worked with Ben and Jerry's, but works with many of the, man, the big companies you've heard of. Jason Harris back on the show. It's so good to have you back, man. How are you? Hey, it's great to be back. And also mechanism is misspelled. It's with a K, not a C-H, because that was taken. So when, when we went to, to get it, uh, mechanism.com, my partners and I, instead of arguing for another name, we just changed the spelling because it was easier. And, uh, and it's easier to trademark, too. It is. It is indeed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I'm here. Great to be here. Uh, I did have a question for Paulette, if I can. Ask, yes. Do you try to write run on sentences so you get paid more? Does that <laughs> happen at the New York Times or no? I will tell you when you're paying me a dollar a word and they're like, just like 1200 to 1500. I'm like, you're getting 1499. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's awesome. Very liquid. general length. I definitely go as high as I can. <laughs> 
Uh, Jason, not, not yeah. only, Bag, let's talk to you about you for a second for our stackers that might have missed when you were on the show earlier or missed when you hung out with me on our Money with Friends show. Uh, you not only have the awesome book, The Soul for Art of Persuasion, which I absolutely loved and we st- st- I still recommend and hand it out to friends. You're now so. in the podcasting business? I did. I started a podcast uh, uh, last summer. Awesome. So tell us about the podcast. Uh, the podcast is called Soul and Science, and we talk to the world's leading marketers, uh, primarily founders, CEOs, and CMOs about how they view marketing and how they built their brands. And uh, we, you know, keep it keep it tight. It's like a twenty five minute podcast, and that's really targeting the advertising marketing community. But I was looking at your guest lineup. Go walk us through some of these names because you've got some impressive names that have been on the show. Yeah, we have um, you know C- CMO of Shake Shack. We had you guys know uh, Ryan Serhant from yes. you know, Watch That Show. Sure. Uh, yeah. Um, what million dollar listing? So talked about how he built his business. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of great shows. Paulette, uh, by the way, there. Jason. Paulette is friends with good friends with one of uh, Ryan's co-hosts. Oh, is that right? Yeah, I got to meet got to meet Ryan when I went up to New York. Yeah, it was really funny. He, no, he wasn't there guy. actually. Yeah, um, he all the rest of the cast was on uh, Watch What Happens Live. So yeah, I work with uh, Kristen or Kristen Jordan. I still say Kristen. Oh, fun. Kristen yeah, Jordan really fun. from the show. But you, but I'm assuming you can get the podcast wherever podcasts are, wherever they're listening to us now. I, I bet Jason. Uh, you can yeah anywhere absolutely it's available. We're gonna we're going to talk today about marketing yourself, since we've got the marketing guru behind Mechanism with us today. Plus, we have Diana, who's had to market herself in the Economy Conference. OG, who had to market himself when founding a financial planning business. Paulette, who's had to market herself every time she looks for a new job. So, man, we got the power group today. So, let's get started. <laughs> Our piece today comes to us from uh, The Ascent, and this is really a piece for business people, but you know what? Uh, I think it's not for business people. Even when I read this, I thought, man, we all got to be marketing ourselves. OG, let's start with you, man. If somebody's out there listening to this, certainly if they own a business, that they're in business for themselves in a small business, they know how important it is to market yourself. But our average nine to five listener, why do they need marketing? I mean, everything really revolves around it, right? Whether it's promotions or, you know, the the coveted uh, uh, new contract that you want to be a part of or something like that, you know, you, you need to uh, you need to let everybody know what your skills are and and uh, that you're interested in kind of growing. I think a lot of people get really comfortable being kind of where they are and assume that the people around them are similar. And if that's not where you where you ultimately want to be, if you want to do something better or kind of move up. You got, you, you kind of have to be your own advocate. But, but Jason, I hear what OG saying and I like that, but you know, a lot of people think, well, I don't want to be a self aggrandizer, right? Like, how do you, wh- where's that line between I'm doing good marketing of myself and I'm just a blowhard out with the peacock feathers showing off in front of everybody. Uh, yeah, unfortunately you got a peacock today. In today's world, you've got to really have a clear message and, talk about yourself and get yourself out there. And you can do that a myriad of ways. But for me, you know, when I think about marketing, whether it's brand or marketing your personal brand, it's all about, you know, differentiating yourself. Number one, you got to be unique. You got to have a point of view and, and something that you're talking about that is yours and yours alone. And you have to create value. So if you add the value piece, it's less just about peacocking. It's also about informing, discussing, you know, creating a community. So I think when you add the value piece to differentiation, you're doing more than just flexing. You're actually adding value to people. And that's the important component. Would you say that's better marketing anyway, Jason? Oh, yeah, definitely. You got You have to do that. Yeah, Paulette, uh, uh, assuming you agree with Jason on choose a niche, know your stuff. Uh, talk to me about that, like finding that niche, because writer, writer's pretty wide, right? I mean, how do you mm-hmm. niche that down further? 
I do struggle. And I mean, I just having launched my powerhouse writers program, I had to do all the Instagram reels. I was in this world a lot. And when it, when it was like, okay, day one, now I can't accept any more students. I was like, okay, gosh, thank goodness. I don't have to do that anymore. So I was, I do both agree and also struggle a little bit with putting myself out there so much. So the niche that I have, I have a few different ones and having ADHD, I certainly have a really hard time deciding. So it's difficult for me. So this is not my expertise. I know mentally that it is the best idea. But as far as serving writers, I decided my niche was I want to make writing easier and more fun for writers. And I love those two adjectives as my North Star for what I do when I'm serving other writers and helping other writers. So every time you you get on social media, then you're thinking those two things easier, and more fun. Yeah, like this morning I got on a reel I wanted to make and my shirt was like, inappropriate because it was like an, one of my artist shirts and I was like well this is like artist Paulette and then I'm like a goofball and that's just who I am and some people might be like that's kind of an inappropriate shirt for a reporter to be wearing and I'm like well I'm just a person who writes you know so so being able to I think one of the biggest things for me is being able to turn off the people who are not into who I am in order to be able to really appeal to the people who are all about who I am so, f- so- you just, just find the yes people Jason Oh yeah, I was just going to say I think I think you described what I was talking about perfectly because uh it's, it's not differentiated to be a writer, right? And you want to be able to take on you don't want to be so niche as a writer that you're only thought of for a certain amount of stories, right? You want to be able to write anything. You don't want to be like just the whatever uh prosthetic arm writer because that would be very limited, right? You would have very few stories to write about. Uh, or just the sports writer or, or whatever. You want to be able to cover a lot of issues. But you're adding value because you're helping other writers. That is the piece that is different and add, and creating value for your audience. And that's a good example of, of creating your platform. And I think to your point about um, not worrying about your core audience and not trying to be so ubiquitous, uh, we, we're seeing that in Super Bowl advertising now with you know the whole fake M&M controversy where i don't know if you guys have been following is that, that a fake t- is that a fake controversy yeah, it's, de- it's definitely fake uh tucker carlson well tucker carlson's not fake he's talking about how even you know the woke le- liberal mob is ruining m&ms uh by you know their m&ms try to be more inclusive creating all these characters one's about mental health the you know there's female empowerment characters so they've created these spokes candies and tucker carlson's on a rant about them and so m&ms came out Pre Super Bowl and said, uh, "My Rudolph's now our, now our spokesperson because we don't want to be caught up in the controversy of the spokes candies." That saying, what we're going to see when they reveal their ad, I'm sure, is it's going to be all about inclusivity, and they're leaning into their that audience, and they might alienate the right, but they're doing that because they're talking to their core and they're living their values, and they're trying to differentiate, even though that's not about. We're going to, you know, not stoke the controversy because we want to be for everyone and not piss anyone off. I think that's an example, just like what you're saying about um, focusing on your core and uh, brands do the same thing. They'd rather double down on their core than try to be for everyone. You can so. you can almost say, Jason, I would think, think about what some of your perceived weaknesses are that people see. Well, you know, Diana's this or OG is this and turn that into a turn that into, it, it sounds like Eminem's just, you know, Tucker Carlson goes off and they're like, yeah, let's see if we can make money off of all this free advertising that he's given us. That's exactly right. I mean, that is that's the game now. The game is earned impressions and trying to get in the news cycle because that's a lot better than just spending you know, crazy amounts of media dollars, especially in a potential economic downturn. It's really about that earned media. So they saw that as a good opportunity. I want to I want to dive into a different piece of this, which is, you know, this this article goes into what if you don't know enough, right? What if you don't feel like you're you're strong enough? So it says find an hour a day to read up on market research articles, find clients to talk to and to dive in, uh, really begin becoming the expert and share what you're learning as you go. I'm thinking, Diana, about a couple of years ago when you really dove in from being somebody that followed personal finance stuff, right? 
to being a creator and somebody who's now marketed as, well, she runs a big conference. She must be somebody that knows everything about personal finance. Did you have to fight off any imposter syndrome while you were marketing yourself and marketing economy? Oh, 100%. And I, I don't even really refer to myself as like an expert. A lot of people in this space, like I'm a personal finance expert. I call myself a personal finance enthusiast because even on my podcast, like I talk to my audience about there are things that I am learning right alongside them. And I think that makes, you know, as a creator, it can make your content a little bit more accessible when, you know, you don't want to intimidate your audience. Like, Hey, I know everything and you're, I'm just going to, you know, sit up here on my high horse and tell you how it is. Like I really am learning alongside my audience in many ways. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, that makes it more appealing. I wanted to say when I was like doubling down, like, okay, I'm going to start to do some videos and, oh, like so uncomfortable with it. And how can I address this in a way, how can I do marketing with my own face in a way that I, that is like self-approved. And to me it was, I'm just going to talk about things that I love and together we can love this thing, right? Like if you, I love that word enthusiast because it's like, I love, I love talking about personal finance. Do you like, let's, let's dive in together. Right. And it's not this, it's not putting one person above another person and I love being like, oh, I learned this today. Like, come along with me as I enjoy this aspect of life that yeah. you also enjoy. Especially when we're talking about money, so many people are intimidated. Like, I remember when I was financially illiterate, I didn't think I could start investing until I knew everything. And so I was kind of gun shy about it. And so I think kind of being transparent about that and showing that you don't need to know absolutely everything to be good with money. You need to have the basics down. Um, and so I, I think that that really can encourage an audience to take steps improving their own finances. Uh, I, yeah, Jason. I was just going to say, I think, I think um, both what uh, Diana and, and Paulette said are is is really true. Which I think the article was incorrect on. Like a lot of the article was was right, but I think the become an expert is, you know, if you're trying to build a following in your brand, you should start with like. Uh, yes, I'm an enthusiast, but I want to, I want to become more knowledgeable. So I'm going to take you on my journey versus waiting until you're an expert to then put out content. I mean, you, are you ever really an expert at anything? Aren't you always learning? Isn't the market always changing? Isn't it always developing? Like you're never really going to be an expert. If you come off as an expert, you're going to look like a blowhard. D -bag, oh, I think, Jason, you know? Jason, Jason, you're not in the personal finance space. Oh, okay. There, there are clearly some experts. Just ask them. Just oh, ask okay. them. They will All tell right. you. That I, I stand experts. corrected. I stand corrected. Diana was talking about a high horse. I was just thinking about uh, uh, the horse I have out back, and I was like, it's pretty high. It's pretty <laughs> I, I like being on my high horse. We need a, do we need a rim shot there? We got a, uh, here we go. There it goes. A little oh, late, there but, go. but yeah, we got it. Hey, hey, OG, it's funny because, you know, a lot of what we're talking about here is not having to be an expert about maybe being a little vulnerable about the fact that you're not. You recently, you know, I'm part of our show. You talked about your kid driving the car through the garage into your house. You've talked about how you've made money mistakes in the past. Like where where is vulnerable too vulnerable? Like where do you draw the line? Mm. That's a good question. I, I I think there's probably some sort of some sort of limit uh, in terms of did you make an error because you were trying to do your best and it just ended up being bad and you learned from it or are you kind of a buffoon and just and just made a mistake for the sake of like like you're too lazy to kind of investigate the right course of action. You know, we talk to people every week about their money and. You know, I can always tell when I'm talking to somebody individually when they're about to disclose something that maybe they're not super excited about, you know, like, oh, I'm 40, but I just started saving and investing or I've got still student loan debt or something. Their voice like changes, you know, a little bit. And and my rule is always, you know, I, I don't think that you're here to talk to me or to talk to somebody about like getting beat on the head for making a bad decision. We all know going into credit card debt is a bad idea, but we don't do it on purpose. You know, we, we look back and go, yeah, that was probably pretty foolish. I probably could have taken a different course of action or I could have cut more or something like that. But 
but you made as good a decision as you could with the information that you had at that time. And now I think the kind of next, you know, the advancement of that is thinking, okay, there is something better. I have to do this differently now moving forward. And that's, I think that's the, you know, that's the growing up part that we like to hear about in, in stories is, you know, I did this thing that wasn't so great. I realized that I, that, that it wasn't so great. And now I'm taking the steps to kind of move in the, in the right direction, even though I, I'm not uh, all y'all's point. I, I may not know the exact, exact path to be on, but I know that we got to turn left. You know, that's, I, I can't go this way anymore. I have to do this now. And we're going to kind of learn it on the fly or learn it together. And that's kind of an exploration, but, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that you know, I I always think that people make as good of decisions as they can along the way, and then in retrospect, we look back and go, Ooh, "Goodness, that, that was." Do you have any? Do you have, you have any crypto stories? Of, <laughs> we, I mean, we just I have, have stories. Share everything. one on the show. Like yeah. seriously, every single money decision, any any money bad thing that you could have done, I guarantee I've already done probably <laughs> twice. You know, and it's like so. Like credit cards. Oh yeah. I've done that. Yeah. It sucked. It would suck so bad that I did it again. And I was like, well, let me just check because being $20,000 of credit card debt was really crappy, but let me see what it's like to be 80,000 in credit card debt. Yeah. That really sucks too. You uh, know, it's like, it's like, is it four times worse? No, not really. It's just worse. You know, it's like I bought a house that I shouldn't have. I bought cars that I shouldn't have. I have spent more money than I make. I, you know, save at weird, you know, the, the wrong percentages and done stupid trades on my, in my investment account, like all those things that you can imagine that people do with their, that their money. But, but it's not because I'm sharing that, like, I'm not trying to do better. Right. It's like, it's like, I, I'm, I'm trying to learn along the way. And I think that's what, that's, that's, that's what you guys are talking well, about. Well, and, and definitely w- w- when we pivoted on this show from, you know, financial experts to people that can tell their story and tell more stories. I mean, that's really when our listenership took off. So you can tell what people are attracted to. They're much more attracted to the journey than they are being prescriptively told what to do. And don't get me wrong. We're going to try to tie those down and give people things. I remember Paulette, when you joined our round table, the, the huge number of emails we got from people talking about, you know, how, how great great it was and how refreshing that you're so open about sharing your mistakes like that was great but my last question before yeah. we go to our, our 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 midway trivia goes to jason jason i'm sure with all the brands you've worked with though there's got to be a time when you told somebody hey maybe you're a little too vulnerable. like like maybe you are in that buffoon territory that og's talking about have you ever had to pull back on the vulnerability from a brand and tell them to cool it down maybe become more of an expert uh, you mean if a brand's putting work out there that is too, like, it's it's too vulnerable, doesn't position yeah, them as an expert? Yeah, exactly, yes. Uh, yeah, for sure, yes, definitely. Um, I, I'm trying to think of a particular time, but, um, I, I, yeah, I, 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 think, I think brands, I think there's a fine line, right? Like, even when we're talking about our individual brands and taking people on the journey, you don't want to be a uh, someone's financial planner and say, Hey, I'm not really an expert at this at all, <laughs> but I'd love to take your money or, you know, but you know, Pe- Peloton's a brand we, we help build over past six years. You know, we don't know anything about, you know, personal at home fitness, but you know, trust us, you know, come along on our journey while we learn. Of course well, you we'll have to come out. out. We yeah, think we'll you should it. pedal faster, maybe for <laughs> yeah. sure buy one of these bikes and listen yeah, we'll, to hip hop while you do it. Our instructors ride. don't know anything, but they're going to figure it out with you. Like, obviously there's a fine All line. like but... out of shape dudes going, <laughs> yeah, yeah. dude, I can only do like 10 minutes on this. How yeah. about you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe eat chicken and waffles halfway through. I don't know. Um, so I think, you know, you have to have a bar of obvious cre- credentials uh, for a brand or for your personal brand. But I think it isn't coming out saying we don't have anything to learn or there's not a new product we can invent that might solve a problem or there isn't, uh, you know, back to ice cream. Uh, you know, we put out, we put out a flavor of ice cream. It didn't resonate. So we killed it. Like we learned from that. So I think there's brands and people are always learning, but yes, to market yourself, you have to have some level of, of knowledge expertise, uh, 
to to be credible for sure. But you're all, you're still always learning. I think that's I don't a know great if that place. answered your question or not. <laughs> I think it was great. I think that's a great place to leave the first half of this discussion. In the second half, we're going to ask our team, when you're on social, what do you think some of the keys are if you're trying to get yourself out there? What's their best marketing advice? This piece also talks about speaking opportunities, finding others and helping them and being inclusive. We'll talk about those in the second half. But for those of you new to Stacking Benjamins, every episode we have a trivia contest on Mondays and Wednesdays. Those are for you to play along but on fridays it is a fight to the death between well maybe not quite the death but it's a big fight between our three weekly contributors uh og paulette and len penzo uh, from lenpenzo.com uh jason today you're playing on behalf of len penzo so you're part of team penzo which by the way jason is good news and bad news do you want to hear the good news first or the bad news i like bad news first well, the bad news, my friend, is that you're going to have to guess first because Len is in first place, which is the good news. So even if you don't win this week, you've got a lead. Uh, Len, Team Len Jason is up, has two wins so far early here in the year. OG's got one. And Paulette, who rocked the second half of last year. Paulette, you're still at zero. What the hell's going on? Not me. <sighs> These questions are dumb. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> Wait a, wait a minute. I agree, I agree with that statement. It's, it's, oh, there we go. It's, it's all the questions because you two aren't winning. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, Diana, let's do the next dumb question that Joe wrote. <laughs> here, 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 here we go. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's cousin, Diana. And among many of the awesome brands Jason's company Mechanism has worked with over the years is Nordstrom which I bring up only because Stacking Benjamins is kind of the Nordstrom of podcasts and I'm sucking up to Jason in case he might be able to score me a discount. Nordstrom ain't cheap. The company, like many in America, has a great story behind it. John W. Nordstrom came to America from Norway in the late 1800s when he was just 16 years old. Here's the question. How much money did young John W. have to his name? I'll be back right after I go make room in my closet for something nice Jason's going to help me score. Jason, uh, I think Diana's hoping you still work with Nordstrom. You guys uh, done anything with them lately? Uh, no. My favorite, <laughs> my favorite. Check uh, out on that one. <laughs> my fave. Well, he still knows people. We did, there, we, know, sure. we, did, we did. We did do work with them for years, but yeah. I got to tell you, my favorite uh, mechanism uh, piece for Nordstrom was the guy who's in this beautiful, these beautiful clothes, but he's out in front of, I think it was a log cabin, Jason, and he's like chainsawing a log. And it's when you want to be a cool outdoorsman, but you're still civilized. I thought that was That's that was exactly a, right. Yeah. Yeah. Shop at Nordstrom. Just an awesome piece. Well, we're going to see how much research you did on your client there, Jason. So John W. came to America, late 1800s. How much money was in his pocket, my friend? It's not a multiple choice. It is not. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, Len. You should have showed up today for work, <laughs> um, I'd say, let's say $225. Two hundred and twenty-five dollars. OG, you go second. I'm gonna say four dollars. OG says four. Why so little? I have no idea. It's a definite <laughs> guess, bro. <laughs> all, the, all the mad reasoning behind our no. I'm just behind our, All right, Paulette, you got two hundred twenty-five on one side, four dollars on the other. What are you gonna do? She's like, I'm going to Google it. I'm going to say five. And even I, that might, you know, OG, it's a I do that's a not like these answer. accusations of cheating. Can I change my answer? Can I <laughs> no, change my answer? <laughs> you may I want to cha change it to six dollars. <laughs> <laughs> no, Jason. Wait, too wait, late let's for ask you. the committee. Let's ask the, <laughs> no. let's ask the committee. I don't yeah. know. They said, uh, all right. Yeah. I, I think that's uh, no, but you learn for next time, yeah. Jason. So we would love to tell you who's right, but we don't play that way. We'll be right back. 
Jason, you opened it up, uh, our guessing about John W. Nordstrom, late 1800s, how much money he brought with him from Norway. You said 225, and I think it took you about four minutes to regret that answer. Yeah, I, well, no, it took me four seconds. I instantly regretted it, actually. <laughs> but uh, then I was committed. So I thought, you know, a, a guy that cares about clothes, cares about fashion, he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't show up with four or five dollars he's gonna have a little bit more than that but then it's not a great story so i'm not sure uh, I, I screwed it up len well i never see we'll it see. in any of the nordstrom advertising and you guys passed over it so maybe you're closer than you think but og you clearly think around jason's reasoning when you went with four it's a better story at four or three you you even get two bucks you get a quarter i do yep yes paulette feeling confident at five I'm feeling confident that if OG accuses me of cheating again without having any evidence, I'm going to crawl through this uh, basement. Well, let's solve this once and for all. Who's right? Who's right this week, uh, Diana? Hey there, stackers. I'm an infrequent Nordstrom shopper, but great customer service appreciator, Joe's mom's cousin, Diana. Nordstrom is known for high-end products, but also for excellent service. Among the many stories about the company, a woman once rolled a tire into a Nordstrom store and the sales associate famously only asked, what did you pay for it? And processed the return even though Nordstrom has never sold tires. But today we're talking about the founder, immigrant John W. Nordstrom. How much money did he have to his name when he arrived in America at age 16? Young John, or Johnny as I'm sure everyone called him, took his money and moved to Alaska in 1897 during the gold rush, turning his money into $13,000, a huge sum back then, which was the money he used to co-found his first shoe store. But how much money did he turn into $13,000? Five bucks. And that means Paulette is our winner. Shocking. Shocking. <laughs> Shocking turn of events, huh? <laughs> Who would have thunk it? Wow. This is not this is not trivia like pro wrestling. Paulette, did you have any idea it was five bucks? I did not. I just chose one more than OG to piss him so off she for fun. It. Yes, and there it is. Why didn't you there Google it? it? And apparently he, apparently he fell right into the trap, too. Congratulations. Start. Apparently Paul they you win these things from now on. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I just want to say that I did look it up, and he, he had $5 in cash, but $220 in bonds. <laughs> So he did. He did have some. IOUs. He did have some bonds that he came over with, and so I. I don't there know. It is. I, I, I think I uh, should get half a point, maybe. Some Jason, we're points. sending you a participation trophy. <laughs> we're going to send you the participation trophy. Please, I leave. want that I don't cake. Want it. On the wall. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. <laughs> All right, time for the second half of this show of our discussion about marketing yourself. Uh, the second half is brought to you by Magnify Money. Mr. Harris, you know what happens when you go to stackybedjamins.com slash magnify money your money gets your money grows it's amazing it is so amazing because what you find out is those brick and mortar banks that everybody shops at not even close to some of the great products they have at online banks and over 92 percent of them are compared at magnifymoney.com whether it's savings accounts high yield savings accounts checking accounts cds all kinds of savings instruments, stackingbenjamins.com slash magnify money. First place to check with interest rates going up. Why wouldn't you check? Compare, ditch, switch, and save. All right. We are on to the second half of this. Let's, let's start off with something here that they talk about. They really make a big deal, Jason, about being inclusive. And your book, I think, The Sulfa Art of Persuasion, really exudes this point all the way through this. Talk about inclusion when you're becoming an expert in marketing yourself. About inclusion, well, I think you've you you know you have to be as inclusive as you possibly can. Um, I always think about when when I think about marketing or or your personal brand or whenever we're pitching a client, and we're all pitching all day long, whatever we do, right? You're pitching advertisers maybe for your podcast. Paulette's pitching story ideas. It's all about wherever it turns, wherever that pitch goes, 
always try to think about it as expanding your network and that you've made a contact, mm -hmm. you've invested in someone's time, you've made a relationship, and that is really where you're growing your value is it's about your your network. And it's not about, you know, turning your back on a prospect, it's about figuring out a way to be inclusive and work on how to bring that prospect uh, into your network in some form or fashion. Not necessarily for a, a sale or for a lead, but trying to keep them in your orbit. But I've so seen some uh, I've seen some people, Jason, do really, really well, really well with this us versus them thing, kind of the opposite of inclusivity, right? Or maybe it's maybe it is. We've got our people that understand what we're doing, but then there's them, right? There's the group of of them that don't understand it, and we've got this exclusive club because we're the people that get it. Doesn't feel really inclusive, but man, I've seen several people use that to their advantage. Is that more dangerous? I just, think not as, just not as I, fun. No, I think it's not necessarily dangerous. I think it's short. It's short term transactional thinking, is what that is. I think the the way to to build you know long term value is is collab being coll a collaborator and seeking out collaborations, and finding value and joining forces with people from you know different areas of expertise and diverse backgrounds and being more inclusive that will help you in the long run but certainly the us versus them can help you in the short term by talking about how you're better and someone's terrible and people do it all the time in the work world there's politics left and right and people can move up by by doing that and pointing out other d people's deficiencies but they get found out it's 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 only short term uh, uh, Paulette, when it comes to your best marketing advice, what would you say your best piece of advice would be? It's very similar to finding your voice as a writer, where I think you start by, you know, by impersonating someone else and seeing what someone else does and trying to hone it toward more and more toward what makes you special and not being afraid to be different and be weird because you're going to find your fellow weirdos. Or if you're like, no, I'm very just like, you know, I'm like, whatever makes you unique or distinct. And it doesn't have to be that you're like a total goofball. Um, it could be that you're just like, I really love Excel. And it's like for the, my fellow Excel nerds, right? Just that one very small thing that makes you different. And and just doubling down on that and not being afraid to show that and show your struggles. Like I have a lot of strengths around writing and marketing. I have struggles with personal finance and ADHD and overspending. And, you know, I think that people are attracted to like actual humanity and not pretending to be perfect. OG for you, best advice, best marketing advice. Kind of like what Paulette said, I like the uh, be yourself component of it because, um, you know, who is that uh, Oscar Wilde or somebody said, like, be yourself. It is everybody Oscar Wilde. Mm -hmm. yes, you know, it is. Be yourself. Everybody else is taken. I mean, yeah. you know, <clears throat> I think I think Paul, you, you just you, you really did nail it on the head. Like you start out by trying to, like, emulate other people that you, mm -hmm. you know, that you like or like you want to model after and then you just have to kind of sort of mold it into into um into really who you are and your own authenticity i think really will bring out the best in like who you know kind of who it is that you're trying to attract what whatever that may be and like kind of who you are like as a person so um I'm just going to steal what she said and just restate it. In another, I, I think, I think, Di I think Diana, that, that whole game though, Diana starts with, if, if, if you are going to model yourself, which I agree with, I remember early when we created this podcast, you know, Austin Cleon, the, the writer says, steal like an artist, right? Take the stuff, riff on it, pay homage to it, make it your own. Don't, don't plagiarize. But, but but it seems like you really start off with these brands and these people you respect and you try to take from there. I bet you, you must have done that with economy, I would think. Oh, yeah. I mean, I just think there's so many different tactics and strategies from a marketing perspective on things that you could do. I mean, it's seemingly endless. I think the way to make it sustainable is to try to figure out like what you actually enjoy doing so that it is authentic and your voice is getting out there and and it's sustainable over time so i i think about like for me i've always struggled with social media it's like yelling into the wind right and i personally don't enjoy interacting 
with people through a screen on social media, through comments and all of that and chasing engagement and impressions and all of that kind of stuff. But what I really enjoy is getting on podcasts. So I've done so over a hundred podcast interviews and that's really where people learn about economy and the format is so much um, a better fit for my business because I really get to explain to people why economy is beneficial, who it appeals to, why you would want to come to this event. Whereas in a you know two second thing you see on social, you don't get that full context and benefit. So I think it really is finding like the strategies that you can actually enjoy doing so that you'll do it for the long term. But it's so hard. Mm-hmm. It's so hard because I feel like, you know, the only quote community, and I don't know how much the community there is anymore in social media, is in social media. You feel like, Jason, people spend, you know, all these studies, people spend less time in local groups. They don't go to local functions. They spend their time on Facebook, on Instagram, on TikTok, on all these different places. Do you have to play that game now? Like when you're coaching a brand or a person, do, do, do people kind of forced onto social? Yeah, there's no no option. <laughs> You've got to be on social media. If you're, I mean, personal brand and brand brand. You've got to be on social media. It's, that's where the that's where the action is. But that's you know what everybody just thought when you said that, Jason? Everybody went, "Oh shit!" Why? Like, no, because I hate it. Well, I mean, then you can build a community on a different. This is your platform. So, but you still have to create assets and market it, right? And you're marketing that on social, even if you hate it. It's necessary evil. You got to do it. Just where the game is. Just where it is. But But I think what everyone, what everyone said, though, I think is the best advice. Uh, Whether you, and, and you can pick your social platform. Maybe you like LinkedIn and you don't, you're not down with TikTok, right? Or... Twitter is where you're going to promote, you know, build your audience or your community for your brand. You don't have to be on every platform, but you got to pick what speaks to you and the way that you like to communicate. But I think, you know, OG and Paul Ed said it really well about you have to be an original. That is the number one uh, piece of advice, which we started the conversation with about being, you know, differentiated and you can become an original by drawing inspiration from your, from role models and people that you want to emulate but then you have to take it a level deeper. Why do they speak to you? What is it about your core values that resonates with the people that you are following or your role models? And you got to write down your core values. Brands have to do it and people have to do it and match those core values to how you're communicating out in the world about your personal brand. It's really important. And that's how you're going to get to you know have a unique point of view. It's funny when I was working in the corporate world, when I am, when I'm uh, working at uh, charitable functions around town, and even when I'm working online, you can just see the people that have done that, Jason, people that are living those core values. Like it exudes everything they say is like this arrow. It, they really, really exude it. Yeah. And that's how you, that's how over time you build that brand and people know what to expect. And we, we do that with the brands that we work with. They've got to know what their core values are. And there's a study, I think it was like a company called Kantar that did a study that's, you know, 68% or 70% of consumers expect brands to live, uh, stand for something and then live those values. Mm -hmm. So they're expecting it from brands. They definitely expect it from people. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great place to end this discussion. Let's find out what's going on where all you guys are at. We'll have our guest of honor go last. Uh, big plans this weekend, OG. Going to watch the Super Bowl? Uh, yeah, I'll probably watch it. Have a little, have a little something. But more importantly, take Monday off. Like we need to, like we need to impress upon people that the Monday after the Super Bowl is an off day. So if we all don't show up, then eventually it will turn into a holiday. Is that because of your love of Woodford? No, I don't drink that anymore. No, you're done. Jason, yep. do you uh, do you you guys represent Woodford? Maybe maybe you can help OG get back in. No, <laughs> we do represent we do represent Jose Cuervo. If you're interested, oh, in tequila. there you go, OG. There's a Super Bowl party no, right I there. Can, I can send you some tequila if you're interested. Send it to Joe. He can have it on my behalf. <laughs> oh, all right. Paulette wants it. Her hands. Paulette, Paulette will get it. Paulette, what's happening? Uh, what do you got going on? 
So I'm talking about like content marketing. I'm doing a karaoke party at a writer's conference of parody songs about being a writer. So I've been sitting around writing parody songs for the last week and it's probably the oh, biggest fabulous. event I've ever put on. And I'm, I'm like nervous and, and scared and excited. So it's the AWP conference for writers. And uh, so just, just prepping for that and writing the songs. And it's been a total blast. Jason's all about uh, Bowie and about uh, Van Halen, right? Mm -hmm. No, not Van Halen. You like no? Van Halen. <laughs> I, like I mean, I like Van Halen, but Bo uh, Bowie, Bowie is, uh, yeah, Bowie's my guy. Yeah, Bowie's mm -hmm. all over the book. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Diana, Economy, give us the dates again and where they can find tickets. Yeah, so it's March 17th through 19th at the University of Cincinnati, and tickets are on sale at economyconference.com. Awesome, and I hope to see a lot of our stackers there. Jason, thanks so much for joining us, man. It's always fun when, when, when we get together. Uh, no, You don't care what my weekend plans are? I, I, I'm going to ask you next. Oh, he's, all right. he's, he's like beating me. But <laughs> Jason, what are your weekend plans? <laughs> Oh, I'm going to a writer's conference to do some karaoke, actually. <laughs> you should I, be so I love, lucky. I love karaoke. I really do love karaoke. I throw I throw a Super Bowl party every Super Bowl because uh, I'm an ad nerd, and I get like uh, 25 people to my apartment and figure out reactions to Super Bowl ads. And you take your like. own USA. You've got like your own mini USA Today poll. I mean, it is for our, for my business, it is the Super Bowl is sure. the Super Bowl. You know what I mean? Like the Super Bowl of writing conferences or the Super Bowl of financial conferences. This is my Super Bowl is the actual Super Bowl. <laughs> Do you spend any time watching the game or is that when you go out and go to the bathroom, get more <laughs> Jose Cuervo? Yeah, no, I, I like to watch the game, but I'm really watching the ads. Because I'm a fabulous. nerd. I'm an ad nerd. I can't help it. <laughs> well, tell us what's coming up on the podcast. Uh, well, I just interviewed a neuroscientist that can predict the success of advertising by studying people's reactions with a headset that he developed. So he does consumer testing and he can tell the, if the, if you need to change the ad based on this like very forward thinking neuroscience technique. That's so I just nice. interviewed that guy. It's crazy, right? Have you read Brandwashed? Uh, Yes, I have oh, read that. that yeah. book. Uh, so good. Uh, so just just interviewed him, and who else did I recently interview? Oh, um, I interviewed the CMO of the or the managing director of the Forbes CMO Network, mm -hmm. who is really fighting for uh, CMOs to um, basically have more relevance in the C-suite. So that was kind of interesting. Yeah, no, it's cool. all it's all nerdy stuff. And that's a soul in science, wherever finer podcasts are distributed. All right. That's going to do it for us today, everybody. Diana, I think you got it from here. What should we have learned? <laughs> so what should we have learned today? First, take some advice from our panel. Don't be afraid to market yourself. Fight the fear and be your best advocate. Second, remember that differentiation and authenticity are the best ways to build your brand when it comes to marketing. But the big lesson? You want to persuade me to eat Ben and Jerry's? Make it an airplane, okay? <laughs> Joe's mom never does that anymore. Thanks to Jason Harris for joining us today. His book, The Soulful Art of Persuasion, is available at Ben and Jerry's near you. We'll also include links to our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. Also, thanks to OG for joining us today. Looking for good financial planning help? Head to stackingbenjamins.com slash OG for his calendar. And when I'm not stacking Benjamins, I produce a party about money called the Economy Conference. Come hang out with me and Joe this March in Cincinnati. Tickets are available at economyconference.com. This show is the property of SB Podcast LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch with help from Joe and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. You can hire Paulette as your very own writing coach. With her program, Your Personal Editor, you get 10 sessions one on one with Paulette to add power to your words. More information at yourpersonaleditor.com. 
Kevin Bailey helped us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find The 411 on all things money at The 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Tina Eichenberg makes the video version of this show. And once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and the root mother of our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with the other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's cousin Diana, and we'll see you next time back here on The Stacking Benjamin Show. Jason, I'm with you. My favorite part of the Super Bowl is the ads. You guys, you guys remember this financial ad? No, oh, this is tragic, man. Investors just like you could lose tens of thousands of dollars on their 401k to hidden fees. Thankfully, E-Trade has low cost investments and no hidden fees. But you know, if you're still bent on blowing this fat stack of cash, there's a couple ways you could do it. And then it goes on. And by the way, it sounds like a straightforward commercial, but what you're not seeing is that's the E-Trade baby. You guys remember the E-Trade baby? So he's got a stash. He's sitting in his crib. He's got a stash of cash. And then it goes in. The rest of the commercial is him uh, showing him playing polo, like barely on the horse. Him, him like in a pool with all kinds of people around him partying in the pool and the baby all over the place. Uh, I also like their uh, money coming out as wazoo. You guys remember that one? The, the, like the guy comes into the emergency room. What's wrong with him? He's got money coming out of his wazoo. Yeah, pretty, pretty good. I'm wondering what you guys, what your, what your favorite uh, the Super Bowl commercials of all time might be. All time. Yeah, all time's pretty hard. I, I would say generally the Doritos ones are usually pretty good. They usually have some decent ones lately. Um, and then Budweiser has their iconic ones. They usually have something. Something that's kind of all in the feels, you know. The um, this is the first year that they're letting Anheuser Busch usually. Uh, they had this, I don't know, multi-year uh, rights where they were the only alcohol that could be in the Super Bowl, and that is up this year. Wow, there's going to be a oh, lot, wow. lot more alcohol brands in the Super Bowl. So that's kind of interesting. So that's kind of new. Uh, crypto. Remember last year was like the crypto bowl. Mm. Right. There, I don't right. think there's any crypto ads now this year. Wow, that's, so that's a shock. Amazing. It's amazing how it's changed. Anyway, no one asks for that information, but we my like favorite it. Super Bowl ad of, <laughs> of all time is the Volkswagen Darth Vader ad. You guys remember? Oh that? yeah, that was just a couple of years ago. It was 2011. Was it really to shut up? <laughs> it was. was it yeah. really? Yeah. Because I remember they did like a whole pre-campaign around that too before the actual commercial, right? Is that the they one we're did, thinking of? Yeah, that's the one with the kid and his dad's clicking and he thinks he's turning it on. His is Darth Vader. The lights. Remember that? Anyone? No? Yes. Okay. Anyone? Bueller. Anyone? Yeah. Anyways, that's my favorite ad. I just pulled up. Uh, I just pulled up one of the Doritos ads. Let's see if we can uh, listen to this. Of all time. Hey man, what's that? It's my crystal ball. It looks like a snow globe. Nah, it's real. Here, watch. Free Doritos at the office today. <laughs> I think that's a yes. Free Doritos. As he throws the snow globe through the vending machine. That's what the crash was. And free Doritos for everybody. I'm sure, OG, that's one you were thinking of. I like those Southwest commercials with the with the uh with the plant with the uh dude in the end zone. Uh the Chiefs are in the Super Bowl this year. Remember the one where the guy gets done and he's like, Who are the chefs? 
and he's just finished with the end zone and put the chefs instead of the chiefs. Forgot the forgot the eye. And then Southwest goes, want to get away? Which maybe Southwest needs a good commercial. That was a that was a Wait, Snickers doesn't he commercial. say great googly moogly? Yes. You can't that leave that out. Commercial. No, that was a that was want to get away. That was a want to get away commercial, OG. It's a Snickers commercial. Jason. Snickers was the Betty White one, right? Jason? Yeah, Snickers was uh you're not you're not you when you're hungry, Snickers you're hungry. satisfied. And that yeah, was great. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the Betty White. That's Betty White, Oogly. yeah. Oogly moogly. Diana, favorite Super Bowl commercial? I wasn't sure if these commercials like originated at the Super Bowl, but I just looked it up and they did. I've always liked the Old Spice. Oh, yeah. The, when yeah, they, they were just great. so funny and like kind of off the wall. And yeah, Old Spice really made a, a comeback with those commercials. What happened to those, Jason? Why did those go away? Just ran out of ideas? They're, they're still doing them. They're not they're quite it. They're still pumping out those Old Spice strange ads. Um, I don't know if they're going to be on the, on the Super Bowl, though. I don't know. Um, it's going to be interesting. I can't wait to see. Yeah. I, th- I think we'll stop it there. We did it. Like Paulette, what's your favorite Super Bowl moment? Oh, my gosh. I'm so glad you asked. Um, so this came out in 1999 when I was in high school. So I was, you know, still into potty humor. Luckily, I've long gotten over that now. Uh, way um, over that now. But it was the Bud Light one where the two guys had to choose between buying beer and buying a roll of toilet paper at checkout. And they chose the beer over the toilet paper and then asked for like a plastic bag or a paper bag. And then I remember at the, like, the last moment, they're like, do you want your receipt? And just the way the guy was like, <laughs> he took it out of desperation. And it was just this great comedy moment where like you give someone like one premise and something else and let the 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 audience kind of make the connection and i thought it was so funny it just cracked me up i don't i don't even remember that one it's called bud light paper or plastic 1999 oh i got it hold on then i have it right here Fine. two guys in line they have no they have no money their card was rejected they don't have enough money no they hand her money again still not enough just toilet paper Bud Light left. With a great taste, they fill you up and never let you down. Paper or plastic? Paper. Make it a Bud Light. Guys, need a receipt? And of course, they grab the receipt quickly. Have you made a Super Bowl ad, Jason? Uh, we've made plenty. We've got, we've had Super Bowl ads at the top of the USA Today ad meter and the bottom. We had one ad that was the last ad. Wow. And we've had like three that were in the top 10. So I've, I've experienced the highs and lows of Super Bowl uh, metering. You, you yeah. must be online at like 5 a.m. looking for the, looking for the uh, metrics, or do you get them immediately? Uh, no, they come out like the day after, but people are voting. That's the way it works. And then what people are saying on Twitter, you're like, you know, really perseverating over the entire night. <laughs> I can't imagine. Because so, you don't really know. You know, you do research and focus groups, and then when it launches, that's really mm. when it happens. But, yeah, we've done ads for Pepsi that were, you know, highly rated, and we've done – we did one video game ad that was that came in last. <laughs> I, if, I don't think I went to work for, like, three days. <laughs> Oh my God. That. Oh, that'd be yeah. so horrible. No that's wonder the best be way. Answered. That's the best way to lose a client. Yeah. J- Jason is either a little Jose Corvo mm-hmm. night or a lot of Jose Corvo night. <laughs> yeah. Either way. You know, you're, yeah. You're, it's either, how much, how much do we have? Joy, joy or despair. Yeah. <laughs>